Dr. Cara Barnett earned her PhD in philosophy from the University of Oregon in 2012. This is her third year teaching at Westminster College. She specializes in American and feminist philosophy. Her current research focuses on the possibility of cross-generational atonement for historical atrocities. She lives in Salt Lake City with her husband and cat and enjoys looking at beautiful sights in Utah from safe indoor locations. I do have to say the professor in me is fighting the urge to give you all homework right now. You're in charge. Think like a robot. Be logical and dispassionate. Are you okay? See, that's exactly what I'm talking about, human empathy. It's as useless as the Winter Olympics. This February on NBC. <laughs> okay. So in this clip from NBC's 30 Rock, Alec Baldwin's character, Jack Donaghy, makes two very big mistakes. First, he devalues the Winter Olympics, something you simply do not do in Salt Lake City, and absolutely never on the Westminster campus. Second, he denigrates the value of empathy, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. In this latter regard, he serves as a barely exaggerated caricature of a common character archetype in popular culture, the socially maladjusted man of reason. Star Trek's Spock and Data, BBC's Sherlock, The Big Bang Theory's Sheldon, and House from House MD, creatively titled, are all examples of men who perform heroic feats of logical analysis by never succumbing to the failings and inconsistencies of those pesky human emotions. This popular portrayal of man of reason has its roots in the philosophies of Socrates, Plato, Kant, Descartes, and others who contend that reason, which they always associated with masculinity, ought to direct both inquiry and morality, and that emotion, which they associated with femininity, is a distraction that needs to be suppressed. I want to talk about the very ideas of what it means to, quote, reason through or remain calm and rational in the face of uncertainty or conflict and how this misses one of the most valuable tools of our experience. Philosophy, our communities, and our world need more from us than some distilled reason, calmed and removed from our emotions, our empathy, and our care. Feminist philosophy is not new to this endeavor. Since the 1990s, theorists such as Genevieve Lloyd, Alison Yeager, Eva Cate, Audre Lorde, and Bell Hooks have argued for embracing emotion with all of its feminine trappings to serve inquiry and social activism. I'm gonna talk about something a bit more specific, how by forcing us to reevaluate the role of emotion and gender, feminism can create a more empathetic world. Fox News commentators may bemoan the idea that we live in an overly sensitive culture, or as Brit Hume put it, a feminized atmosphere that punishes people for speaking honestly and boldly. Yet the weight of evidence suggests that we live in a world in which common failures of empathy produce massive and systemic harms. In July of this year, the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality, in conjunction with the Ms. Foundation and the Human Rights Project for Girls, released a report describing the sexual abuse to prison pipeline. The report claims that many girls who experience sexual abuse are routed into juvenile justice systems because of their victimization. Oftentimes, when they are arrested for their involuntary participation in sex trafficking and prostitution. And the, the report notes that sexual abuse is one of the primary predictors of a girl's entry into a juvenile justice system. The Georgetown Law Report goes on to describe how once the girls are inside the system, they encounter an ongoing punitive cycle of trauma. Since the system is ill-equipped to recognize and treat these symptoms of the initial trauma, it places them in an environment that can readily re-trigger it and often puts them at risk for new incidences of sexual victimization. Instead of treating girls, the system is designed to punish them for behaviors and their that their traumas may provoke. For example, they can be arrested for running away, truancy, or other possible probation violations. And this is why I claim that these problems stem from a lack of empathy. It's a social failure at every level 
from the people who enforce the laws to the people who design the laws to the people who elect the legislators. To envision and to account for the ways the juvenile justice system can perpetuate cycles of abuse. In situations like this, when children are in the most dire need of our care and our support, our policies and prejudice prevent us from treating them like people at all. These kinds of failures are proof that feminism still has work to do. Feminism has accomplished much for women. It has changed laws, structures of family, and workplace environments in ways that empower women. To date, the largest successes in feminism have often centered on granting women what men already have, whether it be the vote, the ability to control one's reproduction, the ability to work outside the home, or equal pay. These are crucial fights that remain an imperative to going forward and are certainly far from over. However, this is not enough. In order to move forward, feminism cannot simply emphasize the ways in which women do what men do. It must also emphasize the importance of the activities and characteristics that have been maligned because they have been considered feminine. During the World Cup semifinal game between England and Japan, English defender Laura Bassett scored an, or, scored an own goal while attempting to intercept a Japanese striker's pass. As a feminist, I will, I will refer to this as the real World Cup, by the way. The player's understandable guilt and distress was met with near universal support from her teammates and her sports journalists in Great Britain. However, some journalists, such as Claire Cohen, argued that support for Bassett was an example of a sexist double standard. Since players for men's teams have received death threats and public ridicule for similar mistakes. Now, I do not deny that the treatment of Bassett illustrates a double standard that needs to change. But as a philosopher, I search for the bigger question. And the bigger question at work here is, is supporting a player through a horrific public moment a sexist problem? Or does the problem come that the from the attitude that tells us that an own goal by a man deserves a death threat? In short, the issue is not that Bassett received empathy and support. It's that men in similar situations do not. While the phrase, the personal is political, became a popular feminist slogan in the 1970s, the idea has laid at the heart of feminism since the, since the beginning of women's suffrage. Early 20th century feminist theorist and social activist Jane Addams argues that true social change cannot occur without feelings of genuine empathy and care. In particular, she claims that charity done for the purpose of an abstract moral ideal is less effective than charity done out of what is called sympathetic knowing, or a movement within us to both understand and care for the concerns of those around us. In contemporary feminist scholarship, we see a continuation of this idea, that empathy is the difference between patronizing moves towards assimilation and genuine care that brings about new relationships. In particular, theorists like Bell Hooks, Maria Lagones, and Patricia Hill Collins have argued that an ability to care for one another, empathize with one another, and recognize a shared humanity with one another is the key to building anti-racist and multicultural feminist movements. For Hooks, this means any community that can move forward from its histories of abuse and trauma must be based in an honest love between community members. For Lagones, social action has to start with what she calls world traveling, or, tr or trying to understand how other people embody the world differently. Finally, for Collins, empathy is the key to successful inquiry because of it, ethics of care requires a fundamental respect for the unique perspectives and individual expressions that subjects involved in inquiry. Before I look at the great social change that empathy can bring, I want to explain the difference between a kind of empathy that can help society and a less useful kind of empathy that does little more than make us feel worse. Sandra Barkey explains that there are different types of empathy. One kind is where you, quote, put yourself in someone's shoes, and the other is when you try to, quote, feel with a, per feel with a person. This might seem like a small distinction, but there's an important difference between trying to imagine what it would be like to be a person and accepting that even though you cannot imagine what it's like to be a person, you can trust their own description, her own experiences, and her own needs. When you simply try to imagine ourselves in someone else's shoes, we take with us our values, experiences, and biases. In other words, trying to put ourselves in someone else's shoes is really a way to make their concerns all about ourselves. As a result, what we think will help another person is often far from helpful from their perspective. In contrast, when we try to feel with a person, 
trust their accounts of their feelings, their experiences, and their needs. We respect them as human beings. We may never know what it's like to be them, but we can demonstrate that we know that they are just as human as we are. One concrete example of feeling with empathy can help, and how this can help people comes from a work, work, the work from a group called Be Girl. From listening to the experiences of girls and young women in nations such as Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Uganda, Be Girl determined girls had begun, begin missing school right around the time of puberty. And much of the time, this is because they lack access to what Westerners might consider basic menstruation hygiene products. Most groups and individuals building schools in incredibly impoverished areas did not consider teen girls' menstruation needs when deciding when and where to put, uh, to put bathrooms. More troubling, in many nations, maxi pads and tampons are prohibitively expensive, meaning that young women have either sequestered themselves from their classmates or they need to find reusable solutions for menstruation prote protection. B-Girl worked with communities to develop safe, clean, and reusable forms of menstruation hygiene. In doing so, they enabled girls and young women an opportunity to return to schools. In order to develop a solution, the advocates at B-Girl had to embrace a kind of feeling with empathy. It wasn't enough to build schools or to push for more egalitarian policies, as cool logic might dictate. And if they had imagined themselves in the girl's place, they may have never imagined that menstruation products would be so hard to find. It would have been fruitless. But by listening to young women, describing their own experiences and needs, and trusting those women, they were able to innovate a new solution.